All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am joined by Melissa Guller, who is in Brooklyn, New York. How are you doing, Melissa? I'm doing great. How are you? Um, absolutely great today. Yeah. Hey, it's 4th of July weekend coming up. That's all good. And uh, Melissa runs Wit and & Wire, and she helps entrepreneurs build their businesses through podcasting. So we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about podcasting on a podcast, which is <laughs> always good. Um, podcasting for online business owners. So, um, Melissa, I mean, a lot of people are interested in podcasting now or are starting podcasts now. And, uh, and so this start the conversation about why is it a good thing? And, and then second off, what kind of groundwork should you do? Because I, I'm coming across a lot of people who are just kind of thinking, I need to have a podcast kind of back in the days, like I need to have a blog. And that's kind of how much thought that goes into it. And then they just launch something. I will say that podcasting is obviously very buzzy these days. A lot of people are mm -hmm. talking about podcasting. And so I know for a lot of people, it kind of brings up this worry of, oh, I want to start a podcast, but is it too crowded to do so? And as of our recording time, there are roughly 2 million active podcasts in Apple last time I checked, and mm -hmm. there are over 600 million blogs. So a lot of people don't realize just how small the podcasting space is right now because it feels much bigger because it's getting so much airtime. And the way I see it, if there's already a podcast out there on what you want to do, or even a YouTube channel, a blog, a social media platform, like if people are already talking about it, I see that as a good sign. It validates demand for your show. But as you kind of hinted at, you know, just saying, I want to start a podcast is just the start. It does take work. Like I'm not here to come on your show and say podcasting is easy. I'm sure you would agree, mm -hmm. but I do think that compared to other mediums, people are willing to tune into a podcast for significantly longer than other forms of content. For example, social media, people see a tweet, an Instagram post, a LinkedIn post for a matter of seconds, if that, but a podcast episode, not only are they going to listen to you for let's say 15 minutes to an hour, you can have a podcast episode of any length, but the longevity of how that content will last over time is so much longer. I mean, I have people find my episodes years after they're released and they write in and they say they found it at exactly the right time. So I think those are the two things that set podcasting apart. One is the amount of time that you can build with relationships with people. And then the second is how long the content lasts. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think as some people, uh, you know, maybe not aware of how long form podcasting, how, how popular it is. I mean, look at uh, I me, mean, Joe Rogan is a fantastic example of somebody who started long form podcasting does like two or three hours and sign that whatever multi gazillion dollar deal with with Spotify. <laughs> but to but it's just underlining your point is that is that there's a it's there's a thirst there for deeper content. And I think people have made that mistake over the years because everybody's like been shrinking everything and saying people don't have an attention span. It's got to be really short and blah, blah, blah. But the reality is actually different because people like to get go a little deeper into the content, especially when it's a podcast. Definitely. And I think about the people who have tuned into even one episode of mm -hmm. my show, just the relationship I've built with that person over 20 minutes or an hour, however long the episode is, I feel like that's worth, I don't know, 20 social media posts. I feel like it's just such an intense amount of value, intense, meaning like a large amount in a small amount of time. And you get to hear somebody's voice. And I think that makes a big difference too. And I know from my experience working with a lot of course creators as well, that going on video can feel very intimidating. So I also think podcasting is kind of a nice middle ground where they hear your voice. So they get to know your personality and your style, but if being face to camera is very intimidating, you also don't have to be on film. Yeah, I mean, I, I, but I would encourage you because I do, I do agree with what you said there. And I think that um, there's a great humanizing element. And I think, unfortunately, social media that was supposed to be like, you know, reflecting personalities is very, uh, it's very dehumanizing in many ways. It's just flicking out things. It doesn't mean it. And or people outsource it. So you're just not even reflecting on your particular personality or whatever. I think if you do a podcast, you can't avoid your true authentic self coming out. Yeah. In a good way. I think that way. social media is so like curated is the word I often use. Mm -hmm. And even if it's well-intentioned, you're really choosing a specific way that people see you for a very short amount of time. But like you said, in an episode, it's a conversation. People get to know you and your personality a lot better. And I do think that that's 
what sets you apart as a business owner, like no matter what topic you choose for your business or your podcast, there will be other people who have the same topic, but people will buy from you because of who you are and your personality and your experiences. And that's why I think podcasting is so powerful for business owners, because people will really get to know you. And at the end of the day, they will buy from a human, not just a business name. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think, uh, and now's the, the greatest time ever, because let's face it, we've been through this, uh, catastrophic pandemic, uh, but people I think are more than ever looking for that connection. So they're looking for authenticity. They're looking to understand who people are. I mean, I always say to people like these podcasts, it's a conversation between two friends who've never met each other before. And then everybody else just gets to eavesdrop. <laughs> and that's uh, and, and for me, that's the perfect scenario because it's all very comfortable and it's human and it's authentic. I agree. And the interesting thing about audio as well is that people can take you with them. Yeah. When people commute, they're listening to podcasts. You can't read, you can't watch videos while you're commuting, while you're cooking or cleaning. So I actually think that the time that people have for audio content is bigger than mm. the types that they might have for other types of uh, content, I should say. Yeah, absolutely. So when you work with, uh, when you work with uh, business owners, and somebody comes to you and says, okay, like Melissa, I want to, I want to, I think podcasting sounds good. I want to get into it. How do you advise them to start? I think the biggest thing for most business owners that actually puts them one step ahead of many hosts is that you hopefully already have a pretty clear customer in mind, because mm -hmm. to me, that's a big thing. I see a lot of hosts skip is they say, oh, my podcast is about yoga. Okay, well, is it yoga for teenagers or yoga for hip pain? Those are so different. So yeah. having that clarity about who your listener is, which likely aligns with the customer of your business, I think is huge. And then from there, much as I think the equipment is important, that's the number one question, of course, I get, right? What microphone do you recommend? But I think for you to sit down as a new host and just try to brainstorm what are 20 plus episode ideas that I could do right off the bat. If you have a hard time even coming up with 20 ideas, it's not to say you have to end up doing all of them, mm -hmm. but I think you're going to be in a bit of a bind moving forward because that could be a sign of either you just need to do a little bit more research. That's the most common, I would say. It could also mean that maybe your podcast topic isn't quite broad enough. Maybe you picked an umbrella too small and you need to just widen a bit. Mm -hmm. But I think just sitting down, seeing A, can I get 20 ideas? And B, do these excite me? Because I honestly believe that if you don't enjoy having your podcast, it's going to be a real uphill battle. And you've obviously done quite a few. And I think that just enjoying the conversations, if you're interviewing or enjoying going solo or having a co-host, that's what will make you keep coming back. And it'll show to listeners too. Yeah, no, I absolutely. Yeah. I've done, I don't know, about 700 plus at this stage. And yeah, you're right. I mean, if you didn't enjoy doing it, um, it it'd be really, really hard. And and that's why it has to be something that you you know you feel passionate about because let's face it it's it's, it's especially if you're doing it regularly you're going to have those days when you're like oh, I'm not sure if I'm in the mood and you have to get yourself in the mood and you have to be on and and then you feel good about it but uh, it's I totally agree with you you have to have a passion for it because if you don't if you're just doing it because you think you should be doing it it's not going to be successful and it's going to come across. Yeah. And if I could ask you a question, what has yeah. been the best part of having your podcast when it comes to your business? Oh, well, there's, there's so many things. Um, to be honest, number number one is it's just purely uh, selfishly, and I feel blessed for it, is, is I get to meet really interesting people like yourself. And I just get to pick the brains of, of like 700 plus thought leaders across the globe. And it's so for me, I use it as a learning experience for myself. And, and I feel if I'm learning something, if I'm getting good information from my guests and the conversation is good, then I believe that that's translating into good content from my audience. So that's, it's really, really interesting people. And then uh, from a business point of view, then when you engage with interesting people and you're doing something that's kind of mutually beneficial, that also, then they, be, they become, um, you know, they, they take an interest in your business and therefore they become perhaps referrals for you later on. They say, I was in this podcast. Are you looking for CRM? Well, I was on this podcast and this guy, he's from a CRM company. Maybe you should check it out. So there's a lot of benefits, but for me, the, the biggest benefit is just the insights. 
Yeah. I mean, I couldn't agree more. I think that's an underrated element of podcasting. I really feel like it's a win, win, win for Mm -hmm. all the host gets great content for the audience. And like you said, you get to learn so much. I've felt so fortunate to interview. I haven't done quite 700. I've done over a (laughs) hundred interviews, but just the amount that I feel like I've learned from getting to ask these very smart people questions has been incredible. And then it's a win for the guest because they get exposure to a new audience of exactly their right people. And then for listeners, of course, they get the benefit benefit of the expertise of the conversation. And I feel in business, it's so rare to really believe that everybody is getting something great out of something. Sometimes it feels just like only one person is getting, or it's an uneven balance, but the people I've met through podcasting have been, like you said, referral partners, real friends outside of work. We built real relationships. I think that that's such an intangible, but meaningful part of podcasting too. Oh, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And I love the fact that you brought up that it's literally like it's a win, win, win situation. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, you win, you're the your person you're interviewing wins, the audience wins. Yeah, it's one of those rare situations where it's everybody is benefiting from it if, it if it's done well. And that's what I think the other part about it, if it's done well, because I have seen some where it's very it's labored or they try to be too you know, like start off with a big advertorial at the beginning and, you know, take about 10 minutes to get into the actual podcast. I mean, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of fundamental errors that people could avoid. So many. I'm glad you mentioned the first part of a podcast episode. I say this often, but the first two minutes, arguably the first 30 seconds are so crucial for your episode because even longtime fans of your show are really asking themselves, is this for me? And if you waste those first couple of minutes, just talking kind of broadly or saying today, here's a podcast episode about this. And here's what we're talking about. That's not going to hook them. Even asking something like a question, like, have you ever considered this? Or so many people believe this, but I disagree. And here's why, or today I'm going to talk about three tips to do this thing. I often say that in the first two minutes, you want to give away the premise, but not the process of the Mm -hmm. episode, because you also don't want to give away your best info because then they don't need to keep listening. But I, I think that's one of the bigger mistakes I see a lot of hosts making is that they don't act like a marketer in the beginning of their episode, because that's the function of the beginning and the title of the episode too. That's another mistake I see people making is the title is just the guest's name, or it's just a vague word. But unless I know that guest, I don't feel connected. So you can include the guest's name, of course, but tell me what the podcast episode is about. And then by the end, I'll love the guest because they talk about it. But if I don't know that person, I'm probably not going to hit play. Yeah, no, th- those are those are great pieces of advice. And I do see, unfortunately, some people fall down on that. The other part is, uh, and this is something that people often uh, ask me about, uh, and that is, you know, so when you have a guest on, do you do you prepare all the questions in advance? Do you send them to them and all this kind of stuff? And I say personally, I don't because I like authentic conversations and I like to see where the conversation goes. And I think that's more interesting. Some people don't feel comfortable with that kind of free flow. I mean, what what's your what what is your thoughts on format? I agree that I think it's kind of up to you. As the host, you'll know yourself best. I will say I don't like to send guests questions in advance. I like for them to know maybe the premise of the episode. Like Mm -hmm. we're going to be talking about podcasting for online business owners. I think that's useful because then I can come in prepared to know who I'm talking to and what it's about. But beyond that, I think guests, first of all, might not necessarily read the questions in advance. So it's not a good use of your time. But I also kind of think it freaks them out more than necessary. And then I find that they come in and they feel very scripted because they've looked at the questions and they've really thought about their answers. So I don't tend to send questions in advance, but I do prepare questions for the interview. And it's way fewer than people think. I don't have a full long list of questions. It's usually just, I don't know, three to five, depending on the length of the interview. And I've done my research. I'm not asking something that people could just Google to get the answer about. And then it's all in the follow-ups. That's where I feel like the real gold of an interview comes is just by being a really active listener. Like I'm exhausted after a good interview because you're just paying such close attention to what someone else is saying in a good way. You're learning a lot, but you have to be really on. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I and I think it is, yeah, because some people, as I said, I mean, some guests do require request questions and stuff. And, you know, I will do that for them. If they do, I will send them some quests. I won't guarantee that I'll actually get to them all because I, <laughs> I like to keep my I like to keep it a little more free flowing. But I think it's a key point. So when you work with people, Melissa, uh, obviously, the podcast has to reflect their personality and every not everybody is 
an entertainer or whatever, but a lot of people are very interesting. You just have to find the right way of, of packaging them. Yeah. Well, I think it's funny because a lot of people assume you have to be very extroverted to be a Mm -hmm. podcast host. I am not like, I'm very introverted. I'd be happy just hanging out on my couch, reading all day. That's more my speed. I do love to teach. There's a separate misconception for a different day about introversion Mm -hmm. and shyness being the same thing. But Mm -hmm. what's great about being a podcast host is that you can use your own personality to your advantage. I think that people who have a very like calm presence about them, are equally wonderful compared to the very loud, brash personalities of the world. And I get a lot of questions about people who worry they don't have a good voice for podcasting. They're worried that they have a really strong accent or they don't like the pitch. It's too high or too low. Mm -hmm. And I strongly believe that that's who you are. And if somebody doesn't like your strong, let's say Southern drawl, that's okay. They're not for you, but some people will love you even more for it because they hear themselves in your voice. And I think representation in podcasting is really important. And the more people who sound different, the better. And in fact, it'll make you sound memorable if you don't sound like anybody else. So I would say everybody has a podcasting voice, but as a more tangible tip, everyone could also slow down slightly when they talk as well. People can speed you up on their app if they want you to be faster. (laughs) Yeah, this is very true. Uh, I know during the pandemic, I know my son, when they're doing online work, they were uh, setting all their um, videos to like two times speed or whatever, mm-hmm. because the professors were talking too slow. Um, they were going to the opposite extreme where they were yes. being really, really slow. Uh, but no, th- I think that's a great point as well is, I think if you're going to be successful in podcasting, you have to embrace who you are and not try to be somebody or not, because I mean, that's going to come across um, very quickly. And I think to your point is people spend too much time stressing on stressing about how they sound or how they look on camera or do do they have the right equipment and less time on am I prepared? Do I have something interesting to say? Do you have do I have the right audience? So sometimes I do think people fixate in the wrong place. Could not agree more. And I noticed you said something about having something to say. That's what Mm -hmm. matters the most. And maybe it's because my background was in a classroom teaching. I used to teach Excel classes to adults here in New York, which I loved. And when you're teaching in front of people, if you make a small flub or you say a filler word like um or ah, nobody even notices. You just keep going and you keep teaching. And at the end of the class, they give you a rave review because they learned something. Uh And I think in podcasting, maybe because it's recorded, it feels so permanent. It feels like we have to be so perfect and all of a sudden filler words don't matter. I will say, a little bit of editing goes a long way. Like if there's a long pause or if you want to restart something, it is nice. If it's not live, you can make those choices, but I really do not believe that you have to edit out all of those small things that just make you sound like a normal human, having a normal human conversation. And yeah, the whole theme of this is just that I think people will like you for who you are and you don't have to go out there and try to sound like everyone else in order to be successful as a podcaster. Yeah, and and I I really think that's a a really critical piece of advice there for people is you don't have to sound perfect and it doesn't matter if you use filler words and it doesn't and it doesn't matter. It's as long as you are engaged and, as we said, have something to say and and you're engaged with your with your guest and you're authentic. I mean, people honestly, I just don't think people care. Yes. I mean, if I'm if I was here going on the whole time, yeah, maybe. But the odd filler word here, the odd flub, it really, really doesn't matter. And I honestly think it adds to the authenticity. I agree. And when it comes to the, I think, way that we all approach a new project is we do look around. We see who else has a podcast, who else is doing something. Mm -hmm. And to a certain extent, it can be a little helpful. I think it can be helpful when it comes to researching topics for your episode or even guests to interview. But I would say at a certain point, it's helpful to not look at your direct competition because if anything, it'll cause seeds of doubt in your mind. Like who am I to start this podcast or what brought me down a couple of times? I'm not afraid to admit is that people Mm -hmm. just, you know, they've been at it for so much longer. And so you look at them and you think, oh, they've kind of checked the box. Like who am I to come in here and start this new thing? But there's plenty of space for everyone. I do not believe there's such a thing as it being oversaturated or too many people There are plenty of people who want to learn how to do the thing that you want to teach or who need the product or service that you're selling. And probably they'll come to you because nobody else like you is doing it. So I think it's better to be unique, to be different. And if something feels good to you, I don't know, just don't look around. I would say look straight ahead and go with your guide as a business owner. 
Yeah, I, I, I would agree. And I think that's another fantastic piece of advice is to not get too hung up on what other people are doing, because, yeah, you'll end up second guessing yourself and talking yourself out of it. And, you know, the imposter syndrome, we've all been through that. We That's uh, very familiar. So but that's probably going to come up for you. But remember, I think the key is to take a step back for a moment and look at all the things you've done or all the things you're doing and your knowledge and expertise and then say, OK, I have something of value to to offer to the world and I'm going to engage with interesting people and I'm going to bring this. And that's it. If you do that and convince yourself of that, you'll be OK. Definitely. And I've heard from a lot of students. And when I was working at Teachable, I heard this a lot as well, that there are huge, big names in whatever industry you're in, the titans, but sometimes they're not very relatable because it's hard to know how you get from where you are to where they are. So sure. what you can do that is a unique advantage for your podcast, for your business, is that you're probably only a step or two ahead of your customers. But I think that's huge because they'll see the point A to point B from them to you in a way that they can't necessarily see it to the Titans. So I actually think you have a bigger advantage than you think if you're newer. You only have to be a step or two ahead to be a great businesswoman, to be a great podcast host, any of the above. Yeah, no, I, I, agree, I agree. And and the other thing is pe people nowadays, unfortunately, because of the kind of culture we live in and that people think that, oh, all these overnight successes, none of them are overnight successes. I mean, they build up over time. And then other people get discouraged saying, well, I didn't get a million views or a million listens, you know, so uh, I shouldn't even bother doing this. And you go, you know, I only got 200. And you go, but were the 200, were they the people you wanted to reach? Mm -hmm. And if you imagine 200 people in a physical room showing yeah. up every single week, then it starts to feel huge. I almost think that in the digital space, the big numbers and the intangibleness of the internet, it makes it feel like if I don't have thousands, then I'm failing. But to me, like 50 people showing up in a room every week would be a huge success. And actually the average or the median, I should say, for a podcast number of downloads within 30 days is something like 140. It's a lot lower than most people think because we're looking at those top 1% podcasts and comparing ourselves to them. So I would just try to, instead of seeing metrics as numbers, see them as human beings sitting in front of you. And I think that helps put things in context. Yeah, no. I, and again, I think that's a great piece of advice for people because, yeah, if you look at them as humans and you think, you know, it doesn't matter, say 20 people uh, listen to your podcast, that's 20 people took time out of their lives to listen to something that you put out there that should make you that should fill you with pride and you humble you to be perfectly honest whether it's 20 40 5, 000, it should humble you the fact that they took time out to listen to what you have got to say yeah i couldn't agree more it's honestly the word humbling i think is the word i often use to describe it people will write positive reviews about the podcast they'll reach out to me and say that a specific episode was a huge help for them and mm -hmm. that matters to me more than any of the numbers, because if you can affect one person's life and make a real difference, I think that's the whole point. But again, in the internet age, it's harder to see that impact unless you hear it from an individual. So those like slightly softer metrics, they're not the things that you can count, but the positive reviews, the thank you for doing this, the, this is exactly what I needed to hear today. Those are the most rewarding, I think, outcomes of being a podcast host. Yeah, absolutely. And especially, you know, business owner, if you're an entrepreneur or whatever, I mean, you should set your, you know, exactly. I think you should establish different types of metrics. You should, sure, it's nice to have a lot of people, but are they the right people? And are you getting feedback from anyone? Definitely. And I will say too, because I'm a course creator, that's how my business, that's my core revenue stream. Mm -hmm. I have a pet peeve in the industry about too many course creators, I think are focusing on making the sale instead of building success stories. And so some, that's something I think about a lot where I don't just want to enroll people in the door. I actually want them to succeed and reach the outcome, which is launching a podcast in my case. Yep. So I think if you focus on thinking of people as individuals, whether they're listeners or their customers, the growth will follow. Yeah, I, that's fantastic. And I think that's a great place to finish on here is remember, think of their people, they're not numbers. And at the end of the day, that's who you're speaking to is you're speaking to people. And whether you're speaking to, as we said, 5, 10, 15, or 10,000, it doesn't matter. Remember, you're speaking to people. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, listen, this has been fantastic. Listen, all of Melissa's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. 
Yeah. If anybody is interested in learning more about launching a podcast, if it's right for you, and if it's something that could suit your business, I do have a free masterclass called how to launch a podcast in 60 days without feeling overwhelmed. And you can save your spot for free at witandwire.com slash sales pop. Excellent. And, and I would encourage people to, to go check it out because, uh, if, if it can save you some time and some headaches and stuff, I would highly, highly encourage it because what you want to be doing is focusing in on your audience and your content. Uh, so go and find an expert like Melissa here and so who can help you to get all the pieces in place in advance because it'll save you a lot of time and, and headaches. And again, it might save you from, uh, it might save you a lot of money from buying like a $10,000 microphone that you don't need. Absolutely. And like you said, I think saving time is so invaluable. I mean, this is a free class, but I do think a big philosophy I have around podcasting is that you don't have to do everything. And if I can help you realize what is useful for you and where I can save you time in the long run, I think that's a huge kindness that I can show students. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, thanks again, Melissa. And thank you all for watching and listening. And I will see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you.